Now, our first group of presenters are from the library, and I got um, and the person who's top billing said, no, no, I don't want to speak first. I want the other person to speak first. So um, I just want to make sure that's okay with Shelby, if you'd be the first, if you want to present first. And now Julie McDaniel is a, a student success um, specialist at the library, and she's available for questions. So I do want to say that what the time is just to make sure when someone is speaking, it's good for us to all mute our microphones. Um, if you're not speaking right now, just so the random noises or other things in the background don't come and interfere with the group. Um, if you need help with anything, I'll be here. Um, to just let me know if you need anything else. But I'll go ahead and let Shelby start. And uh, what I'll do with the speakers is I feel like if you're just going way over, I'll send you a little nice happy text. Um, I won't munge it until you just completely stepped over the time. Um, I'll try to do that as politely as possible. So, but again, we want to make sure it was perfect for time. Again, welcome everyone who's coming in still. Make sure your microphones are on mute. And I will mute mine and let Shelby go ahead and present as our, uh, just for about your role at Sinclair, because you're relatively new to this role. So again, welcome and please, uh, we'll let you go ahead and start. Thank you. And let me know if you have any sound issues with me. I'm down in a basement. It's, sometimes it can be spotty. Um, my name is Shelby Beatty. I'm the archivist and records manager here at Sinclair. I just started in February of 2020 before everything happened. <laughs> so, um, but in that time, I've gotten to do quite a bit of research in our archival collection. And something I was researching early on were women on campus. So I'm going to share my screen, get my presentation started. And Everybody can see that okay, hopefully. Yeah, it looks good, thank you. And your, and your audio is fine. Wonderful, thank you. So today I'm going to focus on women at Sinclair, specifically between 1920 and 1930, when women start appearing um, or documented on campus, and when they start appearing, at least in the records here. Um, I'll begin with a quick overview of the early history of the college before discussing women attending the school. I will also highlight three early female graduates of the school and their very successful careers post-graduation. Most of the historic images you will see um, are housed in the archives on Sinclair's campus. I did my best to confirm identities of early female students and grads using Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org, HeritageQuest, and Newspapers.com. Um, at the end, I will review research opportunities and Julie McDaniel, Student Success, Success Librarian, is also available to answer any questions about the, student, or the Sinclair Library and available resources. Okay, so some quick background on the history of the college. Um, when it started in 1887, the college was called the Educational Department of the Dayton UCA. Um, David Sinclair moved from Canada to Dayton after being recruited by Dayton YMCA officials to start the school, which was started as a way to assist unemployed adults in the Dayton area with training for in-demand meaningful work. Here are two of the buildings where the school was located in the 1920s and 1930s downtown. A photo of David Sinclair is also included here. The college was not formally called Sinclair until 1948. Official records like Board of Trustee minutes and student rosters are spotty during this decade between 1920 and 1930. Ones that do exist do not mention the admission of women at all until they begin to study and graduate from certificate and degree programs offered in the 1920s. But I haven't found an official statement from administrators saying women are now um, eligible to be enrolled on campus. According to a book on Sinclair's early history titled Find the Need, a History 100 years, women could join music class in 1904, but were not formally admitted as students in college. Immigrant women also participated in Americanization and naturalization courses off of, offered by the school in the early 20th century, but again, they were not considered full students. Because the college was operated by the Young Men's Christian Association, there seemed to be hesitation recognizing women as official students early on. This image is a naturalization Christmas banquet. Um, this is undated and it was hosted by the college. We hold many photographs like this, all thought to have been captured between 1910 and 1930. 
Most do not include any identifying information, such as names or nationalities. But you can see here women are included. Women are mentioned in meeting minutes from the 1920s as course participants in these types of classes. It's thought that Sinclair began formally admitting female students to the college after ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. I have not been able to confirm this, but women do begin appearing in college publications at this time. Anna and Lillian, highlighted in the directory here, appear to be the first women to formally be enrolled at the school, taking classes in accountancy and business administration. According to census records from 1920, Anna did bookkeeping for the Economy Soap Products Company, and Lillian worked as a stenographer in Dayton. It's in 1925 that the first known woman graduated with a formal degree from the college. Gertrude Bonholzer likely started taking accounting courses in 1921 and graduated with her bachelor's in accounting in 1925. She's pictured here with her male colleagues. She worked as a public accountant in Dayton after graduation, and that was just the beginning for her. After earning her degree in 1925, Gertrude continued with her studies in law at Sinclair, graduating with her Bachelor of Law in 1930. She was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1932 and attended both Columbia University and Wittenberg University for her graduate studies later. Gertrude was appointed Deputy Recorder of Montgomery County in 1930, taught parliamentary law at UD in 1940, and was very active in civic and professional organizations in the area. She served as director of the Sinclair College Alumni Association in 1954. And here are a few more images that show Gertrude in her later years um, still involved with Sinclair. She worked as a lawyer in Dayton much of her professional life, and she passed away in 1968. Now this photograph was taken, or I'm sorry, this photograph was thought to be the 1926 graduation photo, though it becomes clear that this is not the case when reviewing course catalogs and commencement programs very closely from this time period. According to course catalogs that detail classes offered and they include images, this is a photograph of the 1928-29 YMCA Student Council, not the 1926 graduating class. So Gertrude is sitting in the center, having already graduated with one degree and enrolled in the next. And then Gladys Powell is to her right and Catherine Suber is sitting to her left. Like Gertrude, Gladys and Catherine both had successful careers after attending the college. They graduated with their associate degrees in 1930, the same year that Gertrude got her law degree. According to Dayton City Directories, Gladys L. Powell worked as a bookkeeper for an auto garage in Dayton until graduating from Sinclair in 1930 with her associate's degree in liberal arts. Shortly after, she is listed in directories and the U.S. Census as a math teacher in Kettering at Fairmont High School. Photos here were digitized onto Ancestry.com from Fairmont High School yearbooks, showing a professional teaching headshot and a candid from her classroom. Powell was also involved with the high, school, a high school's Girls Athletic Association. She is listed in directories through 1959 as a teacher in the city of Kettering. She passed away in 1966. Catherine Suber lived in Dayton most of her life. Born in 1903, Suber attended Steele High School, where she was active in the YWCA and Glee Club. Shortly after graduating from high school, Suber began working as a library assistant with the Dayton Public Library System. She worked at the library throughout her studies at Sinclair, graduating in 1930 with her Associate of Liberal Arts. She taught junior high students after graduation through 1937, then returned to the library as a librarian. She continued to work for the library through at least the 1950s. She lived until right after her 100th birthday, passing in 2003. So this is that commencement program from 1930 that lists Gertrude, Gladys, and Catherine as graduates. 
take the time to really review all the names of the graduates. There are many women included that I didn't know about until I found this. So there's a lot of research opportunity there. So Sinclair Archives holds many primary sources that provide names of women at the college, such as commencement programs and class rosters. We also have a great photograph collection where women are well represented. A lot more information can be uncovered using resources available at libraries like Ancestry.com, newspaper research, and local history collections. Investigating the lives of early women at Sinclair would make for an exciting research project. Who was the first female professor? What degrees were women graduating with? I've only researched a small amount about just three women involved in the college's early history. There's so much more to be discovered. Resources like the archives can be a great project starting point. Utilizing services offered by institutions like Dayton Metro Library can really enhance research and help build an exciting story. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I just want to reiterate, and maybe Shelby and Julie, could you both put your emails in the chat so people sure. can copy those? Just it's an easy way to, you know, mm -hmm. um, instead of trying to type with my Costco glasses from your PowerPoint, um, you could, you could put your emails in there. It'd be great for people if they want to contact you for resources. Julie, I'm going to give you some a second here if you want to say something, um, anything about what you do. Um, I think you should talk about your robots because you have the best robots in the world. But I know you're very humble about those, your, your amazing robots. Um, my primary job is to help students in any way that the library might be able to help them be successful. So I'm happy to do that. And in particular today, talking about connecting people with the resources in the archives and helping Shelby out in any way that we can. And the robots that Derek um, gives credit for are um, basically saved searches that we have in the databases that are available at Sinclair. And so if you have some topic that is of interest to you and you just wanna know whenever somebody publishes something new about, maybe we could put in Gertrude's name and see if people start writing about her, um, then the, like those searches just sit out there and wait until something has been published and then we get an email about it and I send that, I and the robots, um, send that on to the folks who work here at Sinclair. And so we're happy to set those up in whatever ways for whatever topics, women's history or not, that might be helpful. Thanks, Derek. Absolutely. I said, well, after, within about a month that Julie came here, I get these emails that oh my God, Julie's sending in all these personally crafted, amazing emails with detailed research things. It's amazing. Oh my goodness. I said, Julie thinks she said, well, it's an automated thing. I don't necessarily have to, you know, but still to put that together and to connect it with the most updated research is really outstanding. So I did something that's really, it's been a great thing. So we've, I'm really happy that we have both of you at St. Clair. Thank you, Shelby. And thank you, Julie. Um, so our next speaker on doc is Rachel, is it Bussert from Dayton Metropolitan Library? Did I get that right? Yes, it's Bussert. Thank you. Most people say Bussert, but that's incorrect. <laughs> um, yes, so um, thank you to Yufeng for um, inviting me today to talk about our uh, historical collection about women at Dayton Metro Library. And now I'm going to See if I can share. I should say while you're doing that, if you if anyone has a question, put that in the chat. I do follow the chats and see it. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to bring that up after the speakers are over. And we'll have some time for discussion at the very end also. So please, if you have any questions, um, make sure to put those in the chat. Sorry about that. I think I have this set up now. So surprisingly, um, well, if you don't know, Dayton Metro Library has been open a lot during quarantine and we haven't actually done a lot of Zoom meetings. So I'm not as Zoom proficient as 
probably a lot of people who've been working at home because we have not been working at home. So, sorry. Oh, here we go. Are you okay. seeing an option of like what to share and you have to like pick one of those windows? Yeah, I do. I'm trying to share um, my Safari, but the only one showing are the things that my daughter has apparently been looking for on Amazon. You could, you may have an option to choose entire screen that lets you do the whole screen. There's desktop. So maybe that, that, would do that. that would be a way what I want to do here. There you go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Again, been working at home. So if your daughter's on the computer, we're just glad that you're not showing up in cat form. So this is a, you're great. You do, you're, I mean, you're yeah. So that's pretty great that I've not shown up in cat form. Um, so again, here's what my daughter's been looking at. Five Nights at Freddy's. Okay, just a moment. Here we go. For those of you that are outside of St. Clair, you should know that our president, uh, Stephen Johnson, has declared that cats, dogs, and children are all not just welcome, but uh, hardly invited guests at all St. Clair Zoom presentations, by the way, just to understand that, that is, you're absolutely welcome. You know, so, so please, um, if you have those pets, be happy to parade them on screen. Okay. Yeah, we can see that. That's perfect. I can see that. So actually, if you want to maximize that or start and open that yeah. up. Yeah. Yep. Oops. There you go. Okay. So how's that work? It's good and your audio is fine and I'll go on mute. Okay. Well, thank you and sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the women's historical collections at Dayton Metro Library. So the Dayton collection was founded within the library in 1888 and we focus on um, material from Dayton and Montgomery County and the Miami Valley. Um, it consists of books, including rare uh, periodicals, photographs, maps um, from as early as 1802. We have broadsides, we have manuscript collections, as you'll see some of them today, uh, newspapers, pamphlets, community and company newsletters, um, and so on. So I'm going to focus on a few of our women's collections that I wanted to highlight for you. Okay, so um, first I want to talk about um, the Electra C. Doran papers. Um, now Electra Collins Doran um, served as librarian of the Dayton Public Library from 1896 to 1905 and then from 1913 to 1927. Um, she was born in Georgetown, Ohio in uh, 1861, and she graduated from Cooper's Female Seminary in Dayton, Ohio in September of 1879. Um, after which time she spent the summer of 1878 in Washington, D.C. Um, under, her, under her father, John uh, G. Doran, uh, who was working as the index clerks of Congress. In 1879, she was hired here at the Dayton Public Library and under which she served as the assistant librarian under um, Minta Dryden. And during this time, she created an analytical uh, dictionary card catalog for the system um, and initiated reference services. 
Um, from 1894 through 1895, she spent a year away from the library to study at the Albany Library School under Melville Dewey. Um, and then uh, during that time, um, when she came back, uh, she also worked with um, a dear friend of hers, um, Linda A. Easton, um, to conduct a, a reading study of Dane schools. Um, I should say, um, Linda Eastman is, not is, um, she was another key figure in um, uh, library history across the field. Um, she served as head librarian at Cleveland Public Library, and there is pretty extensive correspondence between um, Doran and Eastman in the collection. So that's very interesting. Um, so in 1896, Doran was appointed the librarian of the Dayton Public Library, and during that time, she established a, lining, a library training class at Dayton Public Library. And during that time, the library also went through a significant organization, reorganization. Later on, in, also in 1898, she spent six weeks in Cleveland as a lecturer at the library school in Cleveland. And in 1901, she was elected to the office of vice president of the American Library Association at the Waukesha meeting. Um, a few years later, um, she left Dayton Metro Library in 1905 when she was appointed as the first director of the Western Reserve Library School. And only after a year, she retired to public life, but she came back to Dayton Metro Library in 1913 um, after the, it was because of the flood, um, she came back. She was um, kind of asked back to, um, help with the, the restoration of the buildings. Um, so the flood had destroyed a significant part of the library's collection, um, again, to help rebuild the library. And then during that, the years that she would continue working the library, she also built new branches and reestablished the libraries organ as an organization. And Towards the end of her career, um, Doran was involved in, during World War I, um, she became involved in the library war service programs. Um, in 1917, Dayton Public Library formed the War Hospital Service under the Dayton Branch National League for Women's Service. And Doran also served on ALA's um, War Service Committee, which directed War Camp Library Service um, in the United States and also abroad. Um, Doran died on uh, March 4th, 1927. And as you all probably know, we do have a branch in the system dedicated in Doran's name. Um, Doran was also significant when we think about the other collections that we have here at Dayton Metro Library. Um, we know um, that she was involved in the development of the Women's Suffrage Collection. Um, she was involved in uh, the local um, uh, Dayton Women's Suffrage Association and did collect at the, at the time that they were meeting things and kind of saved them. And now we have a really wonderful women's suffrage collection here at Dayton Metro Library. Um, so the collections of what we have in here are the collections of the Women's Suffrage Association and the League of Women Voters, uh, both of Ohio from the period of 1867 um, to not quite the present. Um, the collection includes minutes and diaries within the organizations, resolutions, petitions, speeches, um, correspondence, um, 
we have uh, scrapbooks. Uh, some people are familiar and like to see the 1912 uh, campaign scrapbook. That was a campaign to put a, a constitutional amendment on the Ohio Constitution for women's suffrage. Um, that campaign ultimately did not pass but we have a really amazing scrapbook of the campaign that you can look at. And actually now if you ask for it, um, we'll bring out, we have a couple of facsimiles maybe because it is very fragile. Um, and I, I don't know if I'll have time to point this out to show it to you, but the photographs and the scrapbook from that campaign are available on our Dayton Remembers website. So which is good to know during this time, if you don't feel quite comfortable or you, you know, coming to the library right now, which again is open. <laughs> um, so um, that is probably one of our um, most popular co collections in general that we have here in Day Metro Library. Um, and this photograph that you see here, um, we believe was taken during a um, educational skit uh, that the suffrage organization would do um, for things like, I mean, voting, you know, why should women have rights or how do you vote, um, that sort of thing. Um, it's probably my favorite photograph from the collection to be perfectly honest. So also, um, Electra Doran was key in saving a lot of material that are in our Dayton Metro Library collection. Why am I talking about this? Because um, when you think of librarianship, and we know that a large portion of the library workforce, and this is certainly true for our library system, um, the library workers are composed of women. Um, so we have a lot of um, history in this collection about women in the workplace, um, women as library workers, and women such as Electra Doran and Minta Dryden in library leadership collections. So um, we can see how uh, women were involved in libraries um, here within the community in Dayton, but also on a national level. Um, so in the library collection is from, it covers 1805 to 2005. That's in our finding aid, but we're always adding to it um, because as it is the records of our organization. Um, so we have um, library minutes, annual reports, of course, a lot of photographs, um, newspaper clippings, um, we have book lists that were created by librarians in the collection. Um, all sorts of really um, interesting things that um, about librarianship. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as maybe not the most obvious, but it is kind of obviously a collection that talks about women in the workplace. And this is my favorite photograph from the collection. Again, just sharing my favorite things. This is kind of the vibe that I hope I'm giving off at work, but I don't think I am. Um, okay, so this is one of our newer collections that was donated in 2019. Um, some people may know, have known Margaret Peters as an adjunct in the history department at Sinclair. Um, her papers were donated to us late in 2019. Um, so Margaret Peters had a 30 year career as an educator in the Dayton area schools. And that role also extended into the role of historian for African American history, especially here in Dayton history. And her work really enriched um, the social studies curriculum for children across the region. Uh, Peters was an alumna of the University of Dayton and began teaching in Dayton schools in 1963. She worked with other area teachers um, in the Dayton school, in Dayton schools to add um, black history to their curriculum. Um, let's see, 
Uh, Peters also taught black history at the Colonel White High School before retiring um, in 1993. Um, her first book, Ebony Book of Black Achievement, was used in Dayton schools and focuses on notable um, African American figures in the 15th century through the 1960s. So it's a pretty, pretty good time period. And her uh, second book, which is very well known, very much still highly circulated here at Dayton Mentor Library, is African American Heritage of Pictorial History. Um, that was first published in 1995, and it depicts the lives of African Americans in Dayton from the late 18th through 20th centuries. And I'm just kind of scraping the edge of like all of uh, Peter's achievements. She was also involved in the Zion Baptist after school program, um, chaired the Martin Luther King Jr. scholarship competition and the Martin Luther King Jr. art poetry and prose competition for K through 12 children and has served as president of the Dayton branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, the papers that we have here include interviews uh, from African Americans in the Dayton area, um, programs and scrapbooks um, from the MLK Poetry K through 12 contest. And there also are scrapbooks containing her other community outreach commun um, activities in this collection as well as we also have some documents from Peter's work on the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. And I do want to say, um, I want to go around and show you and hope this isn't awkward. This is um, one of her poster boards we have from her outreach activity. I'm sure you can't really see this well, but I think it's really neat that we have um, some of these artifacts in our collection of um, her role as a public historian in the Dayton area. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about this collection um, and I'm excited to tell you about it. Um, so the Dayton Woman's Club is here, and I'm not going to talk about their history because they're here, but I just wanted to kind of give a shout out and say that we do have records from the Dayton Woman's Club in our collection. Um, primarily what we have are minutes. Um, I was looking at some of them this morning, and I wanted to share um, a couple the first two paragraphs of the report of the Tea Room Committee for 1993. The Tea Room of the Dayton Woman's Club is the heart of the enterprise, and so we reconsider today the state of health in which we find ourselves. Club, it becomes important for us to listen to its heartbeat, um, i.e. the report of the Tea Room Committee. Last year, our diagnosis was not very encouraging. Our pulse was low, our blood pressure a matter of grave concern, our temperature subnormal. We are administering tonics and restoratives and keeping the patient under close surveillance. Daily we expected an improvement in our condition and we spoke hopefully of a feed, speedy recovery. But the chart for 1933 shows no convalescence for our patient. The symptoms are still discouraging even under the care of watchful nurses and doctors. And then they go on to talk about the financial state of the team room committee, which I thought that was just a really interesting way of wording um, a the beginning of a financial report. Um, so we do have those minutes here for those who are interested. And the last collection I wanted to talk about is a um, literature collection that we have in Rare Books. Janet Louise Roberts was a librarian in the Dayton Metro Library System and a romance uh, writer. She wrote um, a few dozen romance um, novels and they are in our collection. 
Um, and she does uh, span a lot of different genres. And again, people who are interested as women and writers in different types of literature may be interested in looking at this collection. Um, we have uh, Gothic Romances, Her Demon Lover. Um, some folks might be more interested in Regency. Um, she has that, uh, Star, Star Sapphire, a Regency Romance. Um, and then we have, if you're more interested in um, Western uh, romances, and these are just um, some, we have the Valet Heritage. Um, you can see more on the back, some of the art. Um, I think that these are really interesting, especially if you just, even if you just like look you know, at the covers of the books, but if you're into pulp fiction or pulp romance, and if that's something you're studying, um, then I think this interest, this collection may be of interest to you. Um, and I just kind of like sharing it with people and I thought it might be fun. Um, so, and that's all I have. Um, so our finding aids and our digital collections can be found on the Dayton Remembers website, which you can access um, through the research page at Dayton Metro Library. Right now, um, the Dayton room is open by appointment Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to six. Um, if you want, I can put our contact information in the chat. Um, it's history at DaytonMetroLibrary.org or 463-2665 um, um, is the library's line. You can use those to make an appointment or ask a reference question. Thank you, like. Rachel. And if you please could do that, put that in the comments there. It'd be great to put that uh, information there. We really appreciate that so much. Thank you for that presentation. I love the looks of the women in that room. It's like, we are too busy typing and getting these awesome card catalogs done. We have no time for your photographic representation. We are yes. women at work. I just love it. It's just a great, you know, it's a great photo. Um, so um, our next speakers, we'll go ahead and um, again, um, we have some people come in from Professor Curtis Kedir's class. So welcome. Um, uh, so if we uh, are gonna go to our third um, duo or our third group of speakers now, and it's um, <clears throat> Margaret Kruckemeyer and Kim Bialva of the uh, Dayton Women's Club. So I'll let them proceed and I'll go ahead and put myself on mute. And you all should be able to share. I think Kim, you have the slides. She should be able to share now, so. Can you hear me? This is Margaret Kruckemeyer. And I just want to say I'm the current president, but your Kim Viala is going to be your president-elect. So we're in, we believe strongly here at growing the club and succession planning is one of the keys to any organization. So with that, I want to say that uh, I really appreciated uh, hearing from our Dayton librarian because what she just described, for my background, I, uh, um, I became a nurse practitioner back in 1975 through the Army support for my education and then came to Dayton uh, to work first at Wright State as an instructor and then on to the VA as a care provider as a nurse practitioner until 2010. And you're president-elect in a case my, uh, my internet connection is unstable. I can uh, tell you that as of March the 16th, our women's club will be going to a much faster support system for streaming so we can also come into the 21st century. If you can't hear me, Kim is going to take over. So with that, let's move on, Kim, because we are here where the where history is living on. And if you see the background floor room at our historic house, we're trying to we'll get through this uh, mission statement and slides and so the history has been really uh unique at the house we were founded by uh, a gentleman who built the house by the name of robert Steele, 
who also was very proactive in the city of Dayton in public education and advancing it, as well as advancing healthcare, where actually the first Miami Valley Hospital was located near Courthouse Square before it uh, went up on the hill. And so with that, he established this mansion and his wife, who was not a well person, but she was a very um, well-read individual and really did a lot of writings, even though that she was pretty much reduced because of her health conditions and can't being out in strong lights. So with that, the house uh, was, a, we know after many flood issues, it did get uh, moved into by 1850. And it stayed uh, under Mr. Steele until he passed and it was taken over by a person by the last name of Darst. During this time, if you're into history, and Kim will be speaking to the Lincoln Society here in Dayton that speaks to the fact that Lincoln came to town. So the, uh, the second lady of the home, which was Susanna Darst, actually probably was a hostess to Abraham Lincoln back on September 17th of 1859. So our history goes back, the house goes back that long. We have actually built on, so after the great flood in 1913, it was Mr. Patterson, when the gentlemen were building the engineers club, recommended that we purchase this woman's club and house. And so the women raised money to put down the down payment. So they moved in in 1916, and it was a hub, if you will, for women to get together to impact what we could do. And you have mentioned some of our trailblazing leaders, and, a, and quite a few of them were actually uh, founding members of the House. In fact, 72 of its original members uh, were active in the suffragette movement, to, especially if you can see this, the, some of our members there on your right-hand side of the screen. Go on to the next one, Kim. So we'll uh, move on. These are some of the books that you will be noticing that we're gonna be highlighting. Our club has been working very hard with a nonprofit to help with uh, community outreach programs, and they were founded in 2001 by William Bell to really emphasize the unique history that Dayton has and to teach it to our children and people of Dayton. So we are very fortunate that they will be added on at the end of this uh, presentation. Here are some of the other things that we just briefly said about, about the purchase and everything. And our ladies were creative. Um, actually, Mary J. Kumler uh, was the one that decided to do a, a stock drive. So for $10 a share, you could buy a part of the house, and that's what paid for the down payment. The total cost of the house back then came to $25,000 after the restoration. So you can see by the comment that uh, we've had our ups and downs, to say the least. Going on. One of the things that uh, we had our coming out party last year, this also celebrated the 19th Amendment where Ohio signed the 19th Amendment for the right for women to vote back in June 4th of 2019. Of 2019 so this is our plaque. You'll be able to find this if you go down Ludlow, uh, starting from Monument and going south, you'll run eventually into the new Schuster Center. So we're really stationed well to say our history is of Dayton is living on. And uh, if you go to our website, you will actually see uh, clips and everything of this. And our website also is going to be uh, being improved too during COVID. So please come and, and visit us there. And I'm not gonna belabor this. So if we can move on. And this just tells you how the marker has read. And uh, thanks to the hard work of our historian, Molly Hauser, who used to be on the board at uh, the Dayton Public Library for many years. So we have strong connections and the women of our club nowadays, we might have, there's a myth out there that it's a private club and you have to be pretty wealthy to belong to it. We are, as of 2017, a nonprofit 501c3. I'm a nurse, and we have many retired school teachers that have really been the trailblazers carrying on. And I 
can say that uh, Dr. Wang is one of our newest board members, so uh, and I thank her very much. So we really are trying to get to be seen and uh, let the public know that we can be your resource and a community asset. And as we say, the uh, one of the things that we did during COVID, uh, after before Washington was cut down, I personally traveled to where the headquarters are for the National Trust, talked to them, and they had a place where they were highlighting a special place called where women made history. And so we actually qualified to then have your house be part of the history that people are learning about us from a national way. And this is the website and how you can connect to that to see other places if you're looking at women's history of where throughout the United States, women work to make history. And if we move on there. Okay, so one of the things closer to home, which is right in our backyard, is Woodland Cemetery. And if you go to their website and we're connected through them, they actually have developed a tour of women of history. And if you click on uh, a picture of the woman, you will actually see the drop down box and a bio of what those women did. And many of the ones that is, are featured by, An by Angie Holzhauser there uh, is also were members of our club. So we really have a very deep history that we want to say, we want to preserve the best of the past, but we're working very hard to improve the present right now. And our goal is to create a better future. And with this, I'm turning this over to have our new president-elect, Kim <coughs> Bulleva, to uh, carry on, Kim. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for this awesome opportunity to speak with all of you. I'll be wrapping it up here in just about two to three minutes. I'm watching our time, but we wanted to kind of end our presentation just letting you know how much this history of means to us, but we want to carry this history forward. The, the overall uh, subheader you saw at the beginning was where history lives on. That history is living. That is our legacy, and that has been going on for over 100 years, and we want to make sure it goes on for another 100 years. So um, we have revised our mission statement, and I, I highlighted, uh, I bolded two sections of that that I wanted to draw your attention to. We continue to be devoted to empowering women, we continue to be devoted to strengthening our community. When you go back and you look at some of the overall history that Margaret talked about, as well as some of the other uh, women that were brought up that were members of our club um, in the recent presentations, you kept hearing these themes about empowering women, about women going out and working on suffrage, caring about the community, what was it that they were doing, and that is where history was made. So that is very important to us as we move forward. We want to preserve that as we go forward and work with new, new audiences. So you can hear, see our mission statement here, how we intend to do that. So that is part of our, our ongoing um, mission. And just to show you, we've obviously had a lot of different examples of how we've done that. But one way that we've done that is to actually go out and try to work with girls. We have worked with the Girl Scouts of Western Ohio, and we taught a empowerment uh, workshop for them. These were some freshmen, some high school freshmen, um, just uh, last fall, I think it was. It was it was somehow in the earlier part of the pandemic before everything was shut down. So we had an opportunity to work with them and to really bring a lot of this a uh, lot of this history to them in a, a, a modern way. Um, we continue to support the suffrage, uh, the anniversary of the suffrage. So you can see us here that we've gotten out. We've, we really try to promote that history and show, um, show how it has impacted where we are today. So what does that mean for what's next for us? Uh, we are going to continue with our programming. We have partnerships with Children's Historical Publishing as well as Sinclair to expand our program offerings and our audiences. We are working on developing a Women's Living History Center. Our home is beautiful. If you have not had a chance to come by and see it, we, we invite you once we are open a little more, um, a little more <laughs> with after the coming out of the pandemic, we invite you to come on by and see it. There is a lot of history there. We wanna also make sure we can further those mentoring and networking opportunities for people who might want to be doing research or might want to connect with others in the community, just like the women did so many years ago. So we have um, 
We have our website here that you can uh, feel free to visit at any time, as well as on Facebook. And we do have a tour that was just recently done, a video that we promoted um, out on our Facebook page. So if you'd like to get a tour from the comfort of your own home, please feel free to click on that as well. And as far as our next program, um, the Thursday, March 18th, in honor of Women's History Month, we will be talking about women's history and focusing especially on on our newest book um, that uh, Children's Historical Publishing has done called Empowered Women, Ohio Women in the Military. So you keep seeing this theme of empowerment. That is truly what I believe the women of the Dayton Women's Club have left as their legacy and they want to continue that. So we invite you to um, stay tuned for more information. You're welcome to join us. So I think that's trying to make sure we're on time. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. That's outstanding. Thank you both for presenting. Um, we're going to turn it over directly to our last speaker, um, not our least, uh, and, and just, I did not know about this resource. I'm really happy the resource is here and Joyce is here to talk about this, it is Joyce um, Kasperzak, and I'm getting the title here so I can have it. My, my window is now being misbehaving because <clears throat> I like to um, okay. have multiple windows open, but I want to get the right organization here. The title is Dayton Histo Children's Historical Publishing. So, Joyce, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm very, very happy to be here today um, with really adoring um, the history of women and knowing how far we've come, and to also understand back in the day when uh, I would say probably in the 60s, if you were being educated as a female, it was suggested you were a teacher or a nurse. So maybe that's why so many great stories have been passed on from generation to generation through mothers and grandmothers and women. And when we go back into history and we try to explain to children uh, what the importance of these events were, it takes on a whole new meaning. Because as most of you know, when you talk to a young child, as your, I think it was our first speaker whose daughter was busy looking for sweatshirts with names on them and things, those were important. But how did that become important? Where did the integrating of, of history and literature and humor, human behavior become part of what we um, learn to move forward? Marketing is based on that. So at Children's Historical Publishing, what we decided back in 2001 was that it was important to teach children, students to look up, no matter what place you were in life, no matter what your uh, opportunities were, if you wanted to be something, you could be something. And what we have done over the past 20 years is we have created 32 learning activity books which as a nonprofit, we go out, search for grants, search for partners, and we donate them into the schools, into their curriculum with teacher guides that fit in today's curriculum for the Ohio State Standards. Now, the books that we've done on women, of course, were the, as Kim mentioned to you, The Empowered Women. This is our newest book, Ohio Women in the Military. And it's a, it's a chronicle of, about the history of what's been accomplished here in Ohio through the women and that have been in the military. We have lots of outstanding stars right here in the Dayton area and right here in the, in the state of Ohio. But more than that, it's the actual fight and what these women had to do to be recognized and be accepted that they were whole people with whole brains and, and good physical conditions, that they could do many, many things that would help serve our country. Uh, as you just went through the history of the Dayton Women's Club, we did a book uh, a few years ago called Empowered Women, and that was to celebrate the ability to vote in the, in the 100th anniversary and to do the history of the Dayton Women's Club because it was a very, very, very important place in, in Dayton at that time. It was the first place that women could come and gather. Now, if you really think about that, 
why was why were women not allowed to gather because we weren't considered uh, to be smart enough bright enough or have enough to say more than embroidering and and doing little uh, household chores that would be important for us to gather together and weren't they surprised when they discovered all the various things that we could really do the women's club is the place where if in the city of dayton you want to think about where all of these things kind of mushroomed from this book goes back into the um, whole history and more importantly than that it helps students explore and make connections to current events there are so many things that women today still are fighting and still are not quite considered a first-class citizen in certain areas or the I, I would say probably one of the most most horrifying things for a professional woman is to say that you got the job because you fit a slot because you were a woman or because you were a certain color woman and not because you were very bright and very ambitious and very determined and we still juggle and we still have to emotionally um, put on a suit of armor when we're out in public and so we're trying to teach this to young girls that some of this doesn't go away overnight and it's it does reflect your choices and how you're going to respond to those situations and to know who you are and that's part of that's part of what our important message is and each one of the the learning activity books that we've done is that you can look up you can be something you will be something if you want to be just to go quickly through our other books that we have done we did a book on credit talks to teach kids about credit we taught them about their dream house if they had credit what would they do when they graduate from high school everyone has to have a place to live where did this come from how did we establish home how did we establish success we did a book on the history of the negro league baseball teams called the curveball we did this with the negro league baseball museum in kansas city and that was a fun project uh, to again talk about what actually happened and what actually occurred and why and how much actual enterprise occurred because of the negro league baseball teams and to say when you didn't fit somewhere you make your own place and you make it bigger and better and if you need a haircut you open a barber shop if you need a restaurant you open up a restaurant because you weren't allowed in there were a lot of things more than playing baseball that occurred that occurred uh, in the whole Negro League baseball team's growth. We, along with our money series, did a book called Money Talks. I'm just gonna move along here. The uh, Haki and the Rule of Law, we did the history of law for children. And it was very, very important. We did this with the Ohio Bar Association and Merle Wilberding, a local attorney, to try to teach kids especially the at-risk kids in some of these school situations to understand the law is made for everyone our first example is if you put 300 children in a room and said let's play basketball and there were no rules and there were no teams how would you know that anybody won and to understand the, that rule the rule of law wasn't made to punish you the rule of law was made to protect you our second book we did with the Ohio Bar Association was done by Merle Wilberding and Susan Elliott from the Dayton Law Library. Haki finds common ground. Now the word Haki, I need to go backwards, means the voice of justice in Swahili. And we have a little book bag there which we were trying to fill with information for the kids. But to go back into using history and historical facts on how how the law was actually how the law was actually made and how we made I mean how common ground was actually used over and over again in history um, our one of our premier books is called train without tracks we did the secrets of the underground railroad 
This cover was done by a fabulous woman, Janice Hughes. She was an award-winning artist. It was owned by Time Life magazine, and they donated it to us for the cover of our book. Uh, inside the book, as you learn about many, many of the um, plights and and fights and and travels of the Underground Railroad throughout the throughout the book, you will hear that grandmother said this and mother said that, and how important it was for women like Harriet Tubman to be part of the movement of the Underground Railroad. Moving right along, we did a book on the magic of the UAW to teach and learn uh, to teach kids about all of the various things on a positive side of history that unions actually um, are there for us, that there are doctors unions, there are firemen unions, there are police unions, and the things that they did in their own philanthropy to actually help the um, community and why banding together with people was so important. The next, going over to the next book, it's very one of my favorite books is The History of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Traits of Success, and that's to teach children right here in Ohio the history of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He's right here, right down the street. Moving right along, we did a book on Home for Heroes that was the history of the Dayton VA, 140 years, and how it was established and how important it is to this city and how important it is to the community. And it was the third oldest VA in the country um, who actually, um, it was established by the signature of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, another book we did on women in history is we did a book called Women in Aviation, and this was done about eight years ago, and I'm sure it's going to need to be updated, and all the advances and all of the women that participated in um, the space age, and to also diminish the fact that um, many times you don't think of what young women were not thought about uh, in terms of having the um, brain power, so to speak, to become engineers and scientists, and, and therefore the birth of the whole STEM project, but to include lots and lots and lots of young women into those careers. The Adventures in Aerospace is just a, a book about the, all of the um, history of aerospace. The Tuskegee Airmen was the great story of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, in our um, wonderful history. And I know I just saw a, a little blurb that the, one of the last living Tuskegee Airmen, he's 100 years old, uh, is going to try to take one of his last flights, which is a fun story. Adventures of Aerospace, Adventures in Flight, we did a lot of work around flight because of 2003 and the history of Dayton's inventing flight, we did a book called Race to Dayton, Amazing Aviation Places to highlight all of the various aviation sites in Dayton. This was done with the kids. Uh, there was a, a little chart in the back of the book that as they attended each one of these, as they visited each one of these places, they got a little check mark, and when they finished, if they finished all eight places, they received a little right there. Ms. Joyce? Yes. Can I give you, I was just say that, that I, we had people come from out of the county to go for that bear. That was amazing what people were so over with that. Can I just give you the two-minute warning? We have people leaving at 12.15. Okay. I'm sure it's time for a quick Q&A. So. Okay. I'll, I'll just flip on through. For the love of dance, the history of the Dayton Ballet, hot air balloons, the amazing arts of Dayton to teach kids that the first lesson was that Mahalia Jackson wanted to dance and she was bow-legged, so her mother made her sing. <laughs> so that the great women in Miami Valley, of course, a lot of women in the Dayton Women's Club, a lot of women you all spoke about. This is a book that, um, that we wanted to make sure got into the hands of the kids. The history of the flood, the 1913 flood, Charles Kettering, the Dayton Inventors, 
and so on and so forth. And what the idea is through our, for our organization is we are a nonprofit. We've donated 590,000 books to the schools in this area. We, we do have uh, teacher guides that we use. I, I just, when listening to the history of the women at Sinclair, that would be a fabulous book for kids in local schools, for local history. They must teach, they must have local history in their curriculum along with having Ohio history. And for, for just to teach these kids to recognize that life wasn't easy and that we had to take what we were confronted with and make something more out of it. And that's the history that you're actually standing on today. That's who you are and why you are. And with that, I will conclude. I will put my website, our website up um, to share for anyone that wants to pop on and see about a book. And anyone that has any great ideas that wants to partner with us on your history, let us know. <laughs> That's outstanding. Thank you. Thank you so much. While she puts that chat in, I do want to give some space for Professor Curtis Kadir. Many of his students are here. As a cultural studies person, I know it's very important to get some contextualization. So I'd like to have him just serve a bit as we discuss it and say some few words of wisdom he can drop for us today. Uh, thank you for everybody for, for coming and attending, especially via Zoom. I know how trying it can be to kind of have these digital seminars it's quite it's not quite the same as being in the same room with each other and sharing that energy but it's still good to see and be seen um as you can see from the the different presentations and the people who've been kind enough to share their time and information with us um, women's history is still very much a robust field and a growing field particularly here locally there's such a very um rich and deep history um, of women from montgomery county and dayton proper um, continuing to push the field forward um, academically, socially, politically, and economically. Um, for the students who are here and also the other participants, I just want to open up the floor for general questions for some of our presenters to kind of pick their brain about maybe even how you got to the point of publishing a book, something more direct and intentional, maybe about Margaret Peters' collection, um, a, a person I hold in high regard as a historian and who I've had the chance to actually have conversations with in the past. She's amazing and things of that nature. So uh, I do want to share and open up the floor for that. So we can take chat from uh, the general audience. Yeah, if anyone can speak up and unmute themselves and speak up. And then also if um, we have anyone wants to type questions in, I see uh, Ms. Kastrzak has put in the CPA chpsbooks.org site there. Um, but we'll uh, we give some space for people to think of any questions you have. If you want to unmute, I'll see that you've unmuted and I can just sort of call you up um, that, that way. I have what might be a combination question for the Women's um, Club as well as Dayton Metro. Uh, the Women's Club mentioned that they were part of the Women's Club Movement of America, and many of those women's clubs started libraries. So it's interesting to me that Dayton Metro started before the Women's Club did. So I guess, do you know, did Dayton Women's Club have any impact on the library and its history? Um, is, go ahead. Um, Maybe the, the women's club can speak first. Well, I'm just saying Elector Dorn was one of our things. And one of the things with the, the problem is that they didn't really get started till 1916, but they did see the need. And actually literary clubs were sprouting up and growing. I think the oldest one was African American Literary Club of 1870. Right. So with that, you know, we have just evolved over time, and that is what's dynamic about the Women's Club that I now belong to is the fact that things change, and so does the world. So how we address in these issues is ongoing. So we would like to have get all of our stuff archived and everything and, and actually have us become like a living women's history center for Dayton. I'll stop there. 
Um, I don't know, have too much to add, but I mean, you know, with Electra Doran being involved in that, um, certainly the club's going to have some influence over, you know, time in the library, but I mean, I mean, the, the library being established prior, yeah. I would say, you know, it's maybe not quite what you're thinking. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, we had this in the 1840s to like the 1890s, I would say we had this, we had this salon culture where people would get together in big salons and just, like, people would have, and usually the richer upper class would have people come to their common rooms and they would come and discuss things together. And then we, then we had libraries, then we had universities. And so those things sort of migrated to those other places. And sometimes bookstores now do the same thing. Well, now that with the pandemic, we're creating our own Zoom salons. We're sort of back to the same practice we did almost 200 years ago of like, let's gather together in my Zoom room and have this conversation and meet in the minds. And I feel like that's something we, we can gather that we can, I, I cannot wait to go back into a big room and talk about things with people in small groups and then have those like lecture series and that type of piece of this, how we want to do this in the future. So I think that's, you know, and even back then, I think like, the 19 this is a woman's suffrage is taking the same time as the pandemic i mean i could easily say where people say no no we don't have time for that now we're going to focus on this pandemic and to realize that all those struggles are happening at the same time just as in today we're struggling with racial equity with all sorts of i mean the women in the workplace have just disappeared because of covid there's all the setbacks in that face all these things we're addressing that we can address multiple issues at the same time that's what robust societies do in democracy. So um, it's interesting food for thought. Uh, I had a question. I, I'm assuming everyone here on some level is a supporter and lover of the liberal arts. And I know particularly for um, my female counterparts in history, it can be a little bit more difficult to find mentorship or someone to kind of model your career after. For the women who are active in the field, um, what do you see as the future of ingratiating more women into this line of work and research, et cetera, to kind of keep these stories and narratives present for future generations? I think Joyce could answer that one best because she is such an eclectic uh, type person of such the hearts of many people here in Dayton. Uh, okay. Joyce, I'm giving you that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I think our uh, okay, Margaret's still sharing. I think our our most important job today is to. Um, understand that these stories and these places and the, all the places you go are important to pass on to children and especially young women or or women and we still need to feel um, that we are equal we we haven't really achieved that in a hundred percent and how we're going to do that is to make sure that we know it's important Make sure that we know that, you know, it's kind of funny, Ancestry.com has taken off like crazy. And everybody now wants to know where they came from and who, who was who in the family. And, oh, I had a Contessa. And, oh, my grandmother wasn't really my grandmother. When I did Ancestry, discovered my father was born a year after my grandmother died. That was interesting. <laughs> and to say that... Uh, why why history has become so and why these stories are so important but why it's so important for women to help other women is because again it's that network it's that it's that rising up it's taking a margaret peters who has worked on many areas uh along with lifting up the african-american community to say who we really were look who we really are this is really important and to go along with saying that if you take apart each one of these women they had they had lives they had they had to study they had to work and they also did that so that we could move on thank you i, I see that holly unmuted herself did you have a question holly i just want to say how much i love the club and it's perfect, it's set 
I've been involved with museums and, and artifacts and we're all getting older. And come on, let's put some money in the house. It really needs it. And what a beautiful repository for our collections that we don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. we, we could make that place a shining jewel. People would be talking about it everywhere, like, like they do in the bigger cities. Let's bring in some goodies to a good house. Thank you. Um, this usually is, when we do this face-to-face, -face, this is something we did last year. Um, Professor Wong was able to bring in a, a grant from the diversity office at St. Clair to help support and have a little bit of food for the students. We will invite you to go have lunch in a socially distanced way um, after this, you know, so we wish we could all be with you together. And then we'll get back to that point at some point. Um, since he is here as one of our sponsors, I'd like to give the space for Michael Carter. If you'd like to say anything, um, a few words. Just only thank you everyone for uh, being involved and, and, and participating. You know, once again, it's, it's an important thing. And, um, you know, it's important for this not to be just something that we do out of a formality uh, one month out of the year. Uh, women's history is, um, is American history and we should recognize it as such. So uh, thank you, uh, Yufong, thank you and Derek and, and, and all that have been involved. Uh, that the things that we do, this is what makes uh, what uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, makes my job just uh, satisfying and, and uh, enjoyable. So thank all of you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I see one person screaming back in the room. So, um, as I often say, the discussion may continue, but I know some people have to go on. So, we, you know, if, if you need to leave, there's no shame in that. We know people lead busy lives. The Zoom commute is a bear sometimes. I know Professor Curtis Kadir has a class at 12.15, so I mean, he's got to go. Thank you so much. But we're here for any of the questions you have. We can stay on for a bit more. Otherwise, we wish you a wonderful afternoon, and thank you for attending the panel. We have additional questions, anything else? I just had a question real quick. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's for Joyce. Um, I have a 12 year old daughter, almost 12 year old daughter. And um, what book would you recommend for her? I feel like um, the her generation in particular, they're, they're just so used to being things handed to them that they don't realize that we women had to fight for what we have today. Right. So, um, sometimes my children will take a lot of things for granted. And now that she's getting older, read a book where she can kind of see why we had to fight hard. I, I would recommend the Empowering Women, the History of the Dayton Women's Club, and the reason I'm saying that, along with the History of the Dayton Ballet, um, because the, you, they can go, they can see, she can see these things are still alive. The Dayton Ballet um, is an interesting story if you take a Jewish woman and an African-American woman in, in the late 1920s and 30s and go to downtown Dayton, where ni neither one of them were really welcomed. And they became the second, the, the um, Dayton Ballet is the second oldest ballet company in the United States. And, and from that, we have, we developed DCDC. Uh, to but but they could but they're still able to know that there is a Dayton Ballet along with the Dayton Women's Club. There's a building there that they could actually tour. So I, I think sometimes to put those two things together are very important that they can touch, feel, see, and hear. A lot of words to say those two books. <laughs> and Thank you. I appreciate also included. He mentioned in the chat, "Still I Rise" is another great one. But yeah, those. Yeah. And I, I was very gracious. I was very, um, we had a very generous donation. We went as a department a couple of years ago to the, the women's club and we got that book on the history of women at the women's club as a, as a gift to those attending. And it was a very gracious gift that we received from them. Um, so that's, and it's an outstanding book. So that would be great. But I'd say the, the Dayton's Ballet one would be maybe one for the age group might be helpful, but either one of those I would recommend. Yeah. And again, Still I Rise is also tremendous. All right. Any other questions? 
Eric, I'd like to make a comment. I, I really appreciate all and enjoyed appreciate all the great presentations. You know, people say that history is everything. It is at least what we have. Uh, women is such an important part of our history. And Dayton, from today's presentations, we understand Dayton is such a historic place with rich learning resources about women and more. You know, not just women, men, and everybody, but women in particular, because this is a march. Um, these kind of resources include archival, physical, and human resources. Not only at Sinclair, at Dayton Metro, we have a wonderful Dayton room at Dayton Metro, particularly at Women's Club, talking about living history, the Dayton Women's Club and historical, children's historical publishing are working so closely together. They're altruistically trying to, to make connections as a professor, a history professor, I feel I'm very excited that I can use these, utilize these resources to help make historical connections uh, for my students to learn and succeed. So this is a really critically important event. And I want to thank everybody, everybody for coming, especially Derek Fahim and gratitude would go to Mr. Carter for helping us for the past six plus years. Thank you. It, it occurs to me, I just think about it going to the transition from living history to documentation. I mean, I just remember coming to Sinclair in 2003 and I got to meet Margaret Peters on multiple occasions. And I'm so happy that her papers are now part of the Dayton Metro Library collection. And my question is, is there, do we have a book about Margaret Peters yet? Is that something to think about? Is that maybe a possible, you know, I mean, another, I mean, this is a date. I think it's thing for impact on history in the region. I don't know if there's something to think about. Yeah, and that's a good point. You know, a um, couple of years ago, when I was in your position, Derek, I spent a lot of time checking on the archival records for our department. What I got was very, very minimal, some pages and then so forth. So historical record is so important. You know, today, maybe we don't feel that, but who knows, uh, 50 years from now, we really wanted to. So part of our responsibility probably is to keep a good record, balance and good record for, for you know, the uh, what we The first week that Stephen Colbert did his TV show, the very first week he had Ken Burns on. And he said, Ken, what terrifies you as a historian? And Ken said, what terrifies me is that and during the Civil War period, people wrote letters and we had documents. Now everything's in the air, it's electronic. And he's, he's just terrified that all these things would disappear. I mean, I think about what, you know, things, I'm, I'm very happy that someone decided to record this because it completely slipped my mind. So we do have a recording of this and we'll make that available and through Ensemble for future presentations. I didn't have the person, but thank goodness that someone has that at least. But, you know, that's the thing is that so many things virtually just disappear into the air if we don't take that presence of time to make sure that happens. So, well, on that note, and if we're open for any other questions. I saw a couple other people had unmuted, but um, again, we're hoping to open take any of the questions you all have. I know many of your classes, you, you have to go, many of your staff are start your lunch hours. So um, we do have time and space for you all. Otherwise, I want to thank you all for coming. And again, great presentations and great questions. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Very good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As a born and raised Daytonian, I'm just so happy that we're doing some stuff for the city. So really good. Yeah. So thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.